Hello everyone, this is Mayron, and I'm really happy to be back. If you want to know where I went and why this series got cancelled temporarily, I would recommend checking out my video log which I just uploaded to YouTube, and it's my last video. That explains why I went and pretty much all my excuses I have. But today, we're going to cover and finish off all the basics before heading off into XML, which I actually have created. I've, I've already created, and well, half created, a video about how to use XML and also about frames and widgets and things like that in order to actually uh, display visuals in World of Warcraft. That stuff's a lot more fun, but I started using things in the code which I thought, oh shit, I'm really going to have to explain that. So uh, this is what this video is about, just to clear up all the loose ends. And uh, I wouldn't worry too much. If you're a, a advanced Lura programmer or you've read some books and you've already got to this stage above which I'm going to be discussing today, then I wouldn't actually worry too much because I'm actually going to be covering some top tips, uh, some things that I've picked up on my own, some advanced stuff which is going to really be beneficial for you in the future, especially when we start talking about meta tables. So for today's agenda, we've uh, got some loops to finish talking about, which are extremely crucial in Lura. And then there's the libraries like the string library, the tables library, and the maths library, also called the math library. Those libraries are things that you don't have to import or, you know, set up in the uh, TOC file and load. They're actually just available from the Lura interpreter and you're able to actually use these functions. But those libraries we're not probably going to cover because most of the stuff isn't really needed and I'll provide links in the description and they're pretty basic stuff but when we need them that's when I'll introduce them. I think for now we should discuss loops and then move on into the more fun stuff in the next video. So when I say loops there are quite a few and they are pretty similar to other languages because usually for loops and while loops you may have already heard these before thrown about in other languages because they're very generic stuff. However Lura has their own ways of handling them which kind of needs to be covered because it's not exactly the same way as you'd see uh, other languages like, you know, JavaScript and things like that. It's pretty different. There's some key differences and we need to get those covered. So, in this notepad++ plus plus I've just created, I've created a new file and I've just named it tutorials.lura and as you can see here, the path World of Warcraft interface add-ons, my add-ons folder and the Lura file. And then I've also got the TOC file which you've seen in episode 1 pretty basic stuff, you don't really need author and default state, I can actually delete those, but you do need the interface code, which is basically the patch number, it tells the World of Warcraft how up to date the actual add-on is. This is the reason why usually it says add-ons are outdated, because this code here is, uh, you know, the registration key is actually outdated. So this is patch 6.2, so that's why it says that just there. And uh, then it's obviously got the files that are going to be loaded in order. And I've only got one, so it's called tutorials.lura. Anyway, moving right along. This is the basic syntax for a for loop. Unlike other languages, you'd, you'd still have three segments, but their purpose is slightly different. The first thing you're going to notice, actually, is that this is a comment block. If I did this, then this is a long string. And uh, I'm not really going to cover them too much, they're not really needed. But if you put the two hyphens just here, like you normally would with a comment, it means anything between this, uh, the two square brackets, and the ending two square brackets, this is all regarded as a comment and not actually rendered or uh, executed by the Lua interpreter. It's actually just ignored. So if you wanted to do a massive comments block, then use them. But for now, we're going to delete them. So now you're able to see all the different keywords in use. The dark blue coloured words are actually keywords like we've discussed before, and there's two new ones called for and do. Now anything between do and end, that's part of the for loop. Anything between the for and do, this part just here, that's the sort of setting up initialization sort of values that you need. Similar to how functions work, you can think of these like parameters that you send and pass to a function, as we've discussed already in the video I talked about functions. So hopefully you're all up to date with that sort of stuff. So you assign a start value and it's going to iterate um, until it reaches the end value. And then you have the step value which tells this for loop each time this iterates and this body of code is executed once, then the step value is going to be added onto the start value. So if the start value was 1 and the step value was 1, 
when this executes the first time, start value will be 1, then it will be 2 and 3 and 4 until it reaches the end value. I think that's a nice way to show you how to section off different uh, sections. You have the start value, end value and step value separated by commas. But this isn't actually what one looks like, so I'm going to delete that. I should have said this, a numeric for loop. There are two different for loops. There's a generic for loop and a numeric for loop. The one we've discussed so far, this is called a numeric for loop. So the start value, the end value, and the step value, these values have to be associated with a variable. Similar to how parameters work in functions, you don't have to give them this, um, this step variable. You don't have to give it the keyword local, because by default it's already local to the for loop. If you try printing it outside of the for loop, this will be null, because this is lifetime only exists during this um, body of code between you know the do and end. You can see it's a block of code, as I've explained before. So anything between seven and nine, that variable called i, that's the scope of the variable. So it can be seen in here. So in line 12, you see that print i, that will print nil. But if I moved it into the actual block of code between do and end, then it will print one. And because I said anything between do and end iterates until i equals 10, this is gonna iterate and print 10 times. Unlike other languages, you think that as soon as i becomes 10, the for loop ends and breaks. However, in Lua, it actually still does print 10. So let me just uh, run down exactly what I'm talking about, exactly how this for loop works. It loops 10 times, so because i starts at one, it's gonna print one, then it's gonna use the step value, which is also one, so the step value will be added to the start value. So the second time, it i will now equal two. Then on the third loop, it will equal three. And so on and so forth until i will equal 10. It's gonna actually print 10. It's still gonna print 10. And then when i is greater than the end value, which is 10, then it breaks. So this will never ever print 11. Unlike other languages, usually you have, instead of end values and start values, you actually have conditions. You'd call this middle section here the end condition, and you actually have to supply something which is going to return a Boolean value. In Lua, you don't have to. So in other languages, you'll do something like this. As long as i is less than 10, do something. In Lua, this is actually, you can think of it like this. When i is less than or equal to 10, keep printing i. But you don't need this. You just need the end value. In actual fact, you don't even need the third segment. This step value... If you don't supply it and do this instead, by default, it's going to add the step value as one. So this is exactly the same as having this. The reason why you might want a step value is because you can actually change one to something else like two. If you had this as two, it's going to loop with the start value first. So it's going to print one. Then it's going to print three because it adds two to one. Then it's going to print five then seven until it reaches over 10 and then it's going to break. It's not going to print anything greater than 10. You can also create a reverse numeric for loop by changing this to a minus one. Now you have to be very careful because the start value is one, it's never actually going to reach 10 because on the first loop, it's going to i is one, then it's going to be zero, then it's going to be minus one and it's never going to reach and surpass the end value. So this loop is actually going to run infinite. It's going to run forever. So you, you have to be really careful about that because if a loop runs forever in World of Warcraft, that will freeze the screen and it's going to cause that, you know, Windows uh, program not responding sort of message. And you're actually going to have to exit the actual entire program. This is especially very dangerous if you're working with saved variables because if you've changed your saved variables file and in World of Warcraft crashes, it's not going to get a chance to save the saved variables and they're actually going to be lost completely which can even corrupt data so you have to be really careful with that for instance if you altered an add-on it like you had um i don't know shadowed unit frames you have a unit frames add-on you customize your unit frames make the health bars bigger and everything like that then you're playing with add-ons and you break something you have to close world of warcraft exit it and also you didn't reload the ui if you reload the ui it saves the saved variables if you never reloaded the UI and it crashes, anything that you've changed with saved variables, that's going to be lost. So you might end up losing hours of configuration with add-ons. That's why sometimes it's quite nice to actually reload the UI. 
But that's going off on a tangent, but it's something I think is pretty crucial to note. So if you wanted to do a reverse iterator, you'll change the start and end values to look like this. So the start value is now 10, the end value is 1, and as soon as it sort of goes past the end value, then it's going to break. So let's just try this out extremely quickly, just to show you that it does work and this is doing exactly what I'm talking about. Okay, so as you can see in my chat box, it says 10 all the way to 1, so that does work exactly how I said it would. So now we can move on to generic for loops. 